Okay. Good afternoon and uh, good morning in California, good evening in the Middle East. We have a great panel and uh, of course we discuss a very hot issue, restoring trust in global trade and supply chains. And I have uh, a exceptional panel to address this issue. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Ngozi on Cognon Iviala, the Director General of the World Trade Organization and a member of the Board of Trustees of the World Economic Forum. We also welcome for the first time and a special um, greetings to you, Ambassador Catherine Tai. Madam Tai, you are the United States Trade Representative. Then we have representing business Pat Gelsinger, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Intel. Um, by revenue, I know the largest um, chip manufacturer in the world. We have Sultan Ahmed bin Sulayem, a leader in global supply chain solutions. And we have Martin Lundstedt, the President and the CEO of Volvo. So we have with the semiconductors a very sensitive, let's say, supply issue. We have transportation and we have, uh, let's say, at the far end, at the consumer's end, you, Martin, to tell us about your hopefully not too bad experiences. So the pandemic has triggered a shift from a mindset of just in time to just in case. And we will, uh, during this hour, 45 minutes, we will see what domestic and international changes are needed to ensure the resilience of global supply chains and to rebuild support for trade as an engine of development and prosperity. Now, let me first turn to you, Ngozi. You have, um, do you have, or do we have, the international institutional frameworks which are really needed to strengthen global trade and at the same time to build supply chain resilience? Dr. Ngozi, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Klaus, and uh, good, good day to everybody. Um, to your question uh, on, on resilience for supply chains, do we have international institutions? I would say the answer is yes. We do have international institutions to strengthen trade and, and strengthen supply chains. The issue is whether these institutions are fit for purpose. And uh, what I would say, I can talk about my own institution, a wonderful one which underpins uh, uh, transparency and uh, level playing field in multilateral trade, but there's a lot of work to be done um, in order to be uh, uh, strengthen the trading system and be fit for the future of trade. So the WTO, for instance, needs to modernize its rules uh, and bring them up to date. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> the future of trade, I always say future of trade is digital, a future of trade is green, uh, but we don't have rules that underpin digital trade, and this is becoming uh, the wave of the future. So if we want to strengthen the, the, the frameworks for trade, we need to look at strengthening the rule-based system, multilateral system that we have in place. And I'm very glad that at the WTO, we have 86 members who are presently negotiating an agreement, an e-commerce agreement. And I hope from there we'll be able to lay out uh, the, uh, the rules that can underpin uh, digital trade. Of course, if you look at the other multilateral institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, they also have a lot to do uh, with, with trade. And their issues of the infrastructure for trade for many of the developing countries whom we want to to be part of this multilateral trading system is very important access to trade finance is very important and all of this means that we need to really look at these institutions and see how can they uh, be strengthened and modernized so that they can follow the direction that the the global economy is going with respect to the trading system so in short, 
we have the frameworks, but the frameworks need to be made fit for purpose. And Gosi, when I look out of my window, I can see your building. And I'm always <laughs> thinking uh, how much you have dynamized this, new, this organization, uh, WTO, and how difficult it is to keep 126 countries uh, in line to really achieve in a common agreement um, results. But let me, I will come back to the uh, general issue of trade uh, later. Let me turn back um, uh, to the issue of, uh, or let me focus on the issue of uh, the chip industry, because it's particularly hit. And um, Pat, um, we have seen um, uh, quite uh, serious bottlenecks, and those bottlenecks have had uh, quite some implications, even pol or have even politically. What is your proposal to create a global system for semiconductors where we have the optimal combination of just in time and just in case? Well, well, obviously, obviously this, this has this been a been dramatic a... phase for the semiconductor industry. We saw supply chains disrupted in COVID, and we saw, due to the digitization of everything, right, as I like to say, the superpowers of com compute everywhere, of everything being connected, of infrastructure at scale from the cloud to the edge, and of course, the super glue of AI bringing them together. Everything's becoming digital, and everything digital runs on semiconductors. And what we saw is that uh, we just got focused on cost of supply chain and the optimization of that, and we lost so sight of the resilience and what I would call a geographically balanced resilient supply chain. And thus, with the CHIPS Act in the U.S., you know, we're enthusiastic to see that rebuilding. The industry went from 37 percent in the U.S. to 12 percent. In Europe, we saw it go from 44 to less than 10 percent. And in fact, uh, today, uh, President of the EU, uh, Ursula, you know, uh, indicates that uh, in February they'll be formally bringing forward their CHIPS Act to rebuild the U.S. and the European industries. And I've called it the moonshot, that we would have the U.S. go from 12 to 30 percent. In uh, uh, President van der Leyen's comments today, the Europe going from 9 percent to 20 percent by the end of the decade. And we believe if we would accomplish that, you know, we would now be building a resilient global supply chain for something that's more important to our future than where the oil reserves are, but where are the chips, right? You know, that's becoming more important to hum humanity and every aspect of the digitization of everything. And we're getting enthusiastic support. And of course, we're leaning into that with our commitments. We're, you know, announced multiple new fabs this year or last year. Uh, I'm uh, looking forward to announcing our next mega sites in the U.S. very shortly and doing so in Europe very shortly as well. It's that important to the future of the industry, to economy, to national security, and to the world. Thank you, Pat. I will, I will come back uh, to the political implications later with you, Ambassador Tai. But just a short word, Ngozi. Are you worried about this new phenomenon of national tech, uh, let's say, uh, tech nationalism, let's call it uh, tech nationalism. Are you worried? Well, um, I can I say, say that, uh, yes, the implications for global trade, um, if we start getting too much, governments start getting too much into industrial policy, uh, could be, uh, quite significant. Um, I understand the phenomenon, uh, what Pat has just talked about, of trying to secure supply chains and diversify them. It's also a way of managing risk. So it's understandable to see people trying to uh, nearshore or onshore some of their supply chains. But I would caution uh, that we not take this too far because um, uh, getting too entangled in, in managing um, what industry to support where may also have other implications with respect to competitiveness of the trading system, uh, uh, with respect to the way trade works. So 
Yes, I'm a little worried. Not too much yet, <laughs> but a little. I think we, <laughs> so, so far, far so, so, you know, you in, know spite in spite of all, of all the it. noise about uh, supply chains, you know, most CEOs seem to have confidence that if they diversify a little bit their risk, maybe to neighboring countries away from concentration in one country. Uh, they build factories maybe in different places in the same country that they can manage it. So hopefully we don't have a concentration of kind of industrial policy related actions. Ambassador Tai, I, I think uh, it's the right moment for you to come in and uh, to, to address from your point of view it's a question of, uh, uh, are we heading into a new kind of uh, type of uh, trade impediments and trade barriers through national tech, uh, through tech nationalism? Thank you so much, Klaus, and it's uh, uh, nice to see you, uh, Dr. Ngozi, and uh, fellow members of this panel, uh, some of whom I've had the opportunity and pleasure uh, to meet and work with already. Um, to your question, Klaus, um, I uh, let me get to the, the larger point about um, um, what we're talking about today, which is um, the sense of confidence that we are looking to uh, uh, recapture uh, or to work towards uh, in our global trade system and in our supply chains. Um, <clears throat> I think that it is clear from uh, the conversations we are having with each other around the world internally, whether in the private sector, uh, in government, um, in civil society, that um, uh, the pandemic in particular has laid bare vulnerabilities in this version of globalization that we have in existing supply chains uh, that we all feel strongly that we need to address. On the way to addressing um, uh, this, these vulnerabilities, I want to uh, be balanced in how we continue to talk to each other and maintain the space to bring new thinking and creative thinking to how we trade, uh, how we devise our supply chains, and how we design them for resilience as opposed to just efficiency, your, your, in your terms, uh, for just in case, not just uh, just in time. Um, and along the way, um, you know, I'm sensitive to uh, charges of uh, nationalism, uh, protectionism, I think it is more constructive to for governments uh, to engage with each other, uh, to really um, uh, engage on the interests that we share, uh, which I believe strongly is in resilient supply chains, uh, confidence in globalization and international trade, and um, uh, resist some of the urge um, in terms of name calling. So uh, I think if I were to sum up uh, an answer to your question, it would be yes, I think that we need to be very, very alert to um, uh, this present moment uh, devolving from an opportunity to build a better version of globaliz globalization into one where we are fighting each other. Uh, and that is something that I am very, very committed to as uh, the U.S. Trade Representative. Very reassuring uh, response, uh, um, Madam Ambassador. Let me, let me turn uh, to uh, Sultan uh, Sulayem. You are probably one of the best informed persons what's going on in, in the global uh, supply uh, uh, chains and uh, disruptions. Uh, do we have to deal with a um, phenomenon which is just caused by, um, let's say, the uh, demand increase we have now uh, coming out of the pandemic and uh, some bottlenecks in, in, in uh, meeting uh, the demand, uh, or is it a long-term phenomenon? How do you see it, Sultan Ahmed? Well, well uh, of course, the pandemic uh, has part of the problem, but I don't believe the pandemic is the one that's causing the supply chain problem. I think the supply chain has been exposed and put to the test. Supply chain is fragile, and it has many stakeholders who have not developed. And when the pandemic happened, we saw the weakness of it. And uh, that's why uh, I will agree that uh, we have to go digital. We have to put trust back in the supply chain. We have to invest. And I'm pleased to say that many shipping lines are actually putting a lot of money, including us, into digitalizing. 
and to improve the supply chain. Supply chain needs to be put back the track to be resilient for this pandemic. Uh, you've seen the fragility of it, even with the uh, ship that was stuck in the Suez Canal. The ripple effect was amazing. And today, I would say, if today the pandemic is over, still we will need the whole of this year and next year to go back to normal, in my opinion. Which may have repercussions also on inflation. Um, anybody who wants to um, comment on it? Um, Ambassador and Ngozi. I just, I just want to make a quick comment. Um, I think going through this uh, pandemic and this disruption that we're experiencing right now, um, we have for uh, the last uh, almost two years now uh, been yearning for a return to normalcy. I think that it is time for us to uh, acknowledge that um, our goal really shouldn't be to try to go back to the way the world was let's say in uh, 2019, um, but to take lessons, very hard earned lessons, uh, very painful lessons that we have um, uh, experienced over the past two years and um, take this opportunity to build towards something that is different and better. And I think that this focus on resilience um, is a really critical one uh, and one uh, where I think I want to give um, uh, you a lot of credit for convening this conversation because I think it is really uh, just to reinforce the point uh, about building towards something that is different uh, as opposed to reverting to the way things were before. So that I, will, I will come back um, uh, later to the question. I, I think everybody agrees we have to build a better system. Now, what are the three priorities you may think already about it, uh, to, uh, which we should aim at? in rebuilding our system. And this will be also a question for uh, Ngozi. Now, we lost uh, at least the video of um, Martin, but I know, Martin, I, I just was informed that you are... No, you are back. Yeah. Uh, um, Martin, you are at the receiving end, and um, uh, do you really feel the impact of, let's say, uh, supply chain disruptions. Do, do you have enough access to the chips of uh, Pat? Uh, what is your experience as a um, as a major producer, and how? What What is your lesson from from this, uh, let's say, uh, disruptive situation? Uh, <coughs> thank you, Klaus, for that question. And, and, and of course, we are uh, partly the receiving end, uh, but, but since we are a major producer of, of trucks, buses, construction equipment, uh, we are also a very important provider, of course, to, to some of the questions here and some of the capacity issues to be addressed in the long run. Uh, first and foremost, obviously, we are a global company. We are, uh, I mean, uh, uh, having activities in 190 countries around the globe. And even if we are seen as a Swedish company, 2% of our sales is in Sweden. So we are really, really uh, depending on, on the global system when it comes to trade and when it comes to exchange and, and uh, global supply chains. And when you look at a truck, for example, I mean, only from the semiconductor side, it's consisting between 1,700 uh, ships up to 3,500, uh, 4,000 for, for one uh, single truck. So, of course, uh, there is very, very complex uh, supply chains. And I think there are a number of learnings out of this. Uh, first and foremost, that when we talk about just-in-time or just-in-case, that is maybe a too simple answer to a complex problem because the just-in-time was more impacted in the short run with uh, short-term disruptions where you don't have the story, uh, when you don't have the inventories and the stocks. But when the recovery is coming, it's more about building trust in the entire supply chain, not only your tier one partners or tier two partners, but really to understand and get to know your complete network of the supply chain partners, including the tier three, tier four, tier five. Uh, first and foremost, of course, for the task force and really come back to a normal situation, and we are gradually getting there. But secondly, also to utilize the experience of saying, are we really working as partners in the whole supply chain, or is it still very much a transactional system? And why is that important? It's not only to come back to the 
or going into a new normal because I liked what Ambassador Tai said about that. Uh, but it's also very important for the future real transformation challenges because if we are to really get going with the science-based targets to go to the decarbonization journey, uh, we need to have the grip of the supply chain uh, as partners. And not only when it comes to shipments, but when it comes to content, when it comes to innovation, when it comes to pets, uh, plan about new nodes. So we are investing in our technology with that nodes where they are building capacity and not only talking generically about semiconductors. So, so transparency, uh, understanding, and now when everyone needs really to get to know their supply chain, continue to build on it because you need it for the future in order to win the transformation as well. So, so task force here and now important, long-term strategic implications even more important. Thank you very much. Uh, now, I, I, I come back to you, uh, Pat. Does it mean, and also to a certain extent following what we just heard, does it mean that uh, you, um, your future development is very much to rely on regional hubs of production? where you can serve on a regional basis your customers. Well, we believe very firmly that, uh, you know, our uh, facilities should be global. You know, and we do believe that from all of our factories that we have around the world, you know, we have uh, Oregon, Arizona, uh, Ireland, Israel, uh, Malaysia, Vietnam, and uh, we'll be announcing two more sites. They should be supplying the world. But we also believe that uh, they're benefiting by having a local presence. So to bias them towards supplying the local markets. You know, we do think that that uh, local and uh, some of that's driven by uh, economic benefits, but some of that's also driven by national security uh, benefits. Uh, this is my supply chain on European soil or my supply chain on American soil. And uh, we believe that those benefits clearly can be satisfying local markets as well as uh, global markets. And that's why we say a globally distributed, resilient supply chain, where no market is uniquely dependent on any other supply or any singular location, but there's also always a duplicity of supply chains available across the globe. And we found that in so many cases as we went through it, and Martin's comments on transparency, you know, I also think there's learnings, Klaus. You know, when we went through the financial crisis, some of the things that we started doing after the financial crisis was that we started doing uh, uh, stress tests uh, on the financial system. Well, I think given what the world's gone to, we have to start looking at stress tests on supply chains going forward as well. And, uh, you know, as the auto industry has seen, all of a sudden they realized that their second, third, fourth tier suppliers were no longer having visibility in some of the underlying ingredients and they had sort of lost track of those supply chain implications. And all of a sudden we have uh, Martin's trucks, you know, depending on a $5 a semiconductor components and a $100,000 vehicle is not being able to ship and all the economic consequences you know, thereof, you know, resilience, or as you say, it's, you know, just in case, you know, I think resilience, stress testing, transparency, and obviously Secretary Romando and the efforts of uh, commerce have been about bringing more supply chain transparency as well. I think all of these things become essential if we're going to build a more resilient world to the future. And that has to be one of the learnings from the crisis that we've been through. And Gozi, can the WTO integrate those requests for more transparency into its, its own scheme of negotiations and make it happening, develop the necessary guidelines about it. Yeah, let, let, uh, Klaus, let me first, uh, before I get to that, you know, comment perhaps uh, leaning on something uh, that both Pat and Catherine uh, talked about. Um, the issue uh, of, you know, this risk management or diversification that Pat was referring to. If you step back, I think one of the learnings from this, if you want to call it snafu, supply chain crisis or snafu, is that we shouldn't look at it. It could be seen also as an opportunity. What do I mean by that? You know, this is a chance 
for us to, in this diversification and going global, to integrate those countries and areas and parts of the world, or even parts of a country that have been left behind, not included in the benefits of globalization. So re relocating or diversifying your manufacturing sites uh, to, to, to other countries in, developing, in the developing world, as you seem to be doing, Pat, is a good thing. We see shifts to Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, and so on in our data. And I call it a way of re-globalizing and using this globalization and supply chain to solve some of the inequality problems that Catherine referred to earlier. So let's not all see the supply chain issue as, as one that is a problem. I see it also as an opportunity and actually want to urge uh, those investing like Pat, I like what you said, to use this as an opportunity whilst you're diversifying to also help solve those lack of inclusion type of uh, ideas. The second point I want to make is that in order for supply chains to work, Klaus, you're absolutely right. We need to look at you know, what is happening to the rules-based uh, trading system. We take it for granted. And I want to say we shouldn't, because if it doesn't work, the whole supply chain won't work. If you, if you, if you have uh, 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 people or members who are putting in export restrictions and prohibitions, even one of those will <laughs> prevent some inputs moving from one part of the world to the other where they are needed. And, and that will disrupt supply chains. So we also need to pay attention to how the multilateral rules-based trading system is functioning. And yes, I think monitoring the monitoring function that we have, the transparency function we have with our members is crucial to making supply chains work. We have used it to try and help with the pharma industry, the vaccine manufacturers, working with them to make sure that issues that come up on their supply chains we target them and see if they can be solved where our members are involved. So I think the WTO is crucial to that and people take it for granted, but they shouldn't. Thank you, Angosi, what you did for the medical or for the, um, let's say, uh, important uh, COVID uh, medicine, uh, the vaccines. Uh, you were a major driver of um, making it uh, globally available. But let me, Come back uh, to you, um, uh, Ambassador Tai. Um, I we, we heard the U.S. is is a major player in the international trade system, one of the key essential drivers. Uh, what would you like to see uh, when we improve now the international trade system? What what key objectives would you have? Uh, from your point of view, from the U.S. point of view. Uh, thank you for this uh, question. Um, it's uh, something that occupies uh, me uh, and my agency every single day. Um, in terms of uh, our approach to trade, uh, we are animated by a principle of um, uh, ensuring uh, that U.S. trade policy and global trade policy um, be truly uh, a force for good uh, for the people of the United States and for the people of the world. And uh, to, to build on um, some of uh, Ngozi's comments, uh, because I consider her a really um, a strong and important uh, ally and partner in this effort, um, what uh, President Biden uh, calls a worker-centered trade policy uh, boils down to a trade policy that puts the interests of uh, people and their livelihoods uh, at its center. We need to ensure that trade, as we conduct it, um, supply chains, as we devise them, <clears throat> are built for uh, resilience, um, uh, for the sake of uh, maintaining uh, and uh, allowing for a high standard of living for our people, um, sustainability, sustainability for our people and for our planet, 
inclusiveness to Ngozi's point about this opportunity uh, that we have now, uh, seeing this as an opportunity, and obviously also competitiveness um, for all of our economies and for the global economy. So, um, uh, Klaus, I think that the question that you ask is a really important one. It is about um, the strategic objectives that we put in front of ourselves uh, to lead on trade uh, and to, uh, to lead in terms of uh, um, transforming um, the uh, purpose and the effectiveness of trade um, in uh, in our global economy, that it isn't just to generate um, uh, wealth and income, it is actually to improve the lives of people. Vassar, it fits so well into the philosophy of the World Economic Forum, its uh, stakeholder uh, capitalism concept. Now let me turn uh, to the three business leaders. And um, my, my question would, do, would be based on your experience now of the last two years. Um, what would be your advice to uh, two key political leaders in, uh, related to trade? Uh, what would be your advice? What are your wishes? What should be improved in the international trade system? What would be your concrete proposals? Pat, do you want to start? Sure. You know, one, you know, we're, we're very encouraged by the CHIPS Act in the U.S., the European CHIPS Act, where, you know, governments do need to be involved in these and do need to be uh, setting uh, policies. And there's always this careful line of industrial policy and where they fit. But I think the last uh, couple of years have clearly shown it's appropriate. You know, I do think these concepts of transparency and resilience of supply chain, you know, become absolutely essential. And, uh, you know, don't never waste a good crisis. Well, we've had a good one. Let's not waste it. Let's do things that clearly put us on a course to be better. You know, I love the Ambassador Ty's comments. And, you know, we think of, you know, right, tech must be a force for good. And against that, you know, are we truly building better supply chains, building resilience in the supply chains, and truly using technology to improve the lives of every person on the planet? And we do see that we have so many opportunities as this, uh, you know, these wonderful superpowers, as I call them, continue to evolve. And I do think that uh, we in the industry, you know, we have an obligation to our uh, political partners. You know, these technologies are moving so rapidly. And uh, how do we work with and partner and build policies that truly shape a better world, shape better supply chains, but do so in a way that truly is bringing about a technology that enables this force for good. So we must partner with our uh, political leaders globally. And we do see technology, it's neither good nor bad, it's neutral. How do we shape it as this global force of good? Yeah, Pat. Uh, Sultan Ahmed, I had the chance to visit your uh, logistic facilities uh, just some weeks ago, and I know how much you also are committed to use uh, the latest uh, technologies. What is your advice to the politicians uh, for shaping the future uh, trade uh, context for your company? Uh, it's very interesting when we are dealing with the problem of supply chain. Uh, it's not enough to have uh, the problem of not finding ships or containers. But uh, we got the experience during our help with UNESCO to supply uh, vaccines. Uh, I would urge many government officials to really improve the technology when you talk about custom process, when you talk about documentation. You can't imagine how backward it is still. Something like a vaccine, which is very sensitive to temperature, which is needed to be immediately into the clinic to give it to people, and you still have these old procedures. So I urge leaders really to adapt technology, adapt digital solution, remove some of the bureaucracies that are today existing, which is adding more to what we have already in problems. I think going to technology, uh, digital improvement, we are even at the world offering a custom system to certain countries when we find that they don't have a system. So trade facilitation through a better uh, use of technologies. That's your Absolutely. message. That's your Absolutely. message. And Hans, what, uh, Martin, what is, your, what is your advice to the politicians? <laughs> 
First and foremost, I, I think uh, when we look into the regional value chains, that is something that has been ongoing also to Pat's point after the crisis. We need to reinforce that. But we need to reinforce that also taking into, uh, into account that the globalization has been very positive and it comes to driving innovation. So not be tempted now to have short-term uh, answers that could be opportunistic to, to really go for the long term here, not at least when it comes to the sustainability agenda on a global scale. I think if we can continue to discuss how do we get, even if that will take a while, uh, on a global uh, trading system for, for carbon will be very important in order to drive the right type of innovation. I think uh, when we talk about uh, strategic autonomy, we, we should never forget open strategic autonomy because businesses are best uh, to manage their supply chains and to drive innovation together with different partners. And the transparency that everyone has been into. I mean, with the digital tools, uh, then we can also connect in different shapes and forms to make it both fair and well-balanced and, and thereby uh, making it uh, inclusive. So uh, those are some, some of the things uh, that I think is very important in order to continue to, to develop and to utilize this crisis to also take, uh, take uh, uh, on the challenges for the big transformation that we need to do when it comes to uh, sustainability and to decarbonize uh, these value chains together as well. Thank you, Martin. And Gozi, any, any reaction to those, um, let's say, expectations from the business community? Um, yes. Uh, um, I like, uh, and, and I'm not surprised at, at what I hear. You know, let me start by saying that to speak to the expectations, let's remember that um, this multilateral trading system underpinned by the WTO, actually the purpose of the WTO is was set out to be to enhance living standards, to create employment and to support sustainable development. So going back to what Catherine said and what Pat was uh, emphasizing, it's all about people. You know, and, and, and it's all about making sure that people's livelihoods are taken care of. But who trades? It's the private sector that trades. So I would really urge a strong uh, partnership uh, between the WTO and, and more of the private sector. I often say that I don't see enough of the senior, the private sector people, you know, agitating for strengthening the WTO, which is there serving the trading system. And uh, when you talk about, uh, you know, the governments and digitization, which I agree with what Sultan just, uh, just said, uh, we, we have a trade facilitation agreement. Uh, that is trying exactly to move countries towards that, you know, to remove the red tape, to digitize uh, customs procedures, to modernize it. So a lot of things are happening at the WTO, but I don't know if the CEOs are following that. So uh, to what you say, my answer to you is let's uh, forge a closer partnership, whether it's uh, through working with Klaus or some other means, uh, so that we can see where we can work in a complementary fashion to help people. I really share that. I want to really say, I share what Catherine said. What is the good of trade if it doesn't speak to the lives and livelihood of ordinary people? It's not about just the elite or those making people rich, but we need to look at how does it benefit poor people within rich countries and poor countries in the world? And how do we include them and integrate them into the global trading system? Ambassador Tai, this uh, corresponds certainly to your own thinking, but um, any other comment? Certainly, thank you, Klaus. And um, uh, this is a wonderful panel uh, for, for my own purposes in uh, hearing what uh, my fellow panelists have to say. Um, let me just um, uh, reinforce this notion that um, uh, the opportunity that we have right now uh, is one to um, uh, invest and reinvest, uh, invest in our commitment uh, to uh, the World Trade Organization, um, the world trading system, uh, invest in um, uh, bringing um, an energy of innovation and improvement 
uh, to the way we do trade and certainly uh, to the way that we tailor our trade policies and our trade goals to the interests of uh, people, uh, human beings, uh, regular people, um, and also uh, investment in, uh, in, in ourselves and our systems to uh, Sultan Ahmed's point. Um, I just wanted to highlight uh, the um, um, uh, transformational changes that are happening here in the United States. Uh, President Biden just last week, or sorry, just this week, announced a $14 billion investment in um, U.S. ports uh, to improve and strengthen our waterway supply chains. Uh, last week, uh, Transportation Secretary Buttigieg announced the largest investment in our bridges in U.S. history. That's $27.5 billion uh, to help fix uh, more than 15,000 bridges. Um, and just to say that this spirit of uh, investment and in innovation and renewal uh, needs to be ongoing. Um, the opportunity that we have right now is to set uh, ourselves and all of us on a strong path uh, going into a future that can feel uncertain uh, and uh, can, uh, through this pandemic certainly, uh, shake our confidence. Um, but just to reinforce something that um, Ngozi said, uh, this really is an opportunity and it is a time to think and act uh, boldly. And the partnership, I think, is critical as well, um, uh, both between uh, governments and um, uh, institutional multi multilateral international frameworks, um, governments and the private sector, uh, governments and our civil society. Thank you. And Gozi, we, we certainly uh, will help to provide a platform between, uh, let's say, the public and the private sector. Uh, to build a more human-centered global mm. trade system, but to build it in a very innovative way, as you said, uh, Ambassador. Um, um, we, we come to an end of our fascinating discussion, and I think it was a very constructive discussion, optimistic, so that we uh, can um, create a, a, let's say, a trade framework which is up to the task of the, in the world of the fourth industrial revolution. But I would like to ask each of the speaker, just with one or two sentences, to respond uh, to a last question. What is your biggest fear at the moment <laughs> um, related to the global trade system? What is your biggest fear? Let me start, uh, Pat, um, with you. Maybe building on the, maybe building on the comments of uh, Catherine Tai, there is no going back. We only have to look forward, embracing this crisis, what COVID has induced upon us, to build a better future that's more resilient, more digitized, and that there is no going back to what we used to enjoy. It's all about going forward <laughs> to the future together. More resilient, more digitized, and more sustainable. I Thank, you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Sultan Ahmed. Yourself. You're mute. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I think the technology and changes in technology is what's scaring us all. Uh, really, is are we able to be able to? use the technology uh, on time. Another problem we face really today, which we faced it when we started to introduce and accelerate many platforms that are helping us digitally, is how do you get the people to really use it? Because they think it's only to use it for the problem, and, uh, which we face now. And what we are trying to do is to change the mentality that's what is in the past is gone. This is a new technology and this is what we have to do. A lot of people are <coughs> talking in our company, uh, how long we're going to do this? As if when this is over, we're going to go back uh, to what we did. And that is really a key problem when we have to educate the people and tell them this is it. The new thing is what we have to do. Thank you, Martin. 
No, I think well, it's, I think the, it's the, opposite the opposite of what we have said uh, that is important, obviously, and that is that we are not getting it right when it comes to the balance, both for people, as many have mentioned, but also for, for the planet and for different ingredients, and thereby uh, nurturing and increased protectionism, because that will not help us uh, to, to create a better planet and, and, and a better place for everyone. Thank you. Ambassador? Klaus, your question is really a challenge because I think that, uh, you know, if I'm going to uh, answer it the way you've uh, posed it, uh, I risk being the doom and gloom voice on the panel and I think that we're trying not to go there. But um, let, me, uh, let me say this. I think that what uh, I fear most is uh, that we don't see this, this opportunity. We don't think big enough. We don't act boldly enough. And we don't uh, bring enough new ideas. Thank you. And uh, Ngozi? Well, so let me build on what Catherine said and make three points of three of my fears. Uh, the first is that uh, we don't allow geopolitical tensions uh, to really morph into protectionist measures and policies that use trade as a weapon rather than as a solution. So I lose a little bit of sleep at night about that. The second is worsening inequality in the world, that we place and um, um, position trade to help solve this problem because it's becoming worse with the pandemic. And trade is a solution. It's not part of the problem. It can be part of the solution. So, And the third is when we talk about digital trade, my fear is what you said in the beginning that we, we lag, that institutional frameworks and rules lag behind the emerging new uh, ways of doing business. That's a real fear. We have to work really hard to make sure we keep up with those. Let's conclude by just saying, let's hope that none of those fears become a reality. <laughs> I want to thank on behalf of the participants and the listeners to our panelists for a most exciting um, discussion. I know uh, trade is sometimes uh, regarded as, uh, let's say, something uh, which uh, happens by itself. Uh, but I think uh, we, we had a demonstration not only of the issues, but also of the efforts uh, which we can undertake to really modernize and keep the global trade system open. So a great thank you to you all and uh, good evening, good morning, good night. Thank you very much. Bye everybody. <laughs> <laughs>